Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Payal, and thank you so much for joining in. Today, we have with us Joel and Hari, and they'll both will be sharing their insights on a very interesting topic, which is contract-driven development. And like they'll be also letting us know how we shall be able to deploy our microservices independently without doing any integration testing. So quite an interesting topic to hear. So without wasting any time, over to you, Joel. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this talk. Uh, thanks, for Payal, for the great introduction. Um, so this is about contract-driven development. Before we jump into the topic, a little bit about ourselves. Uh, my name is Hari Krishnan. I'm a consultant and a coach. I help uh, both unicorn startups and uh, enterprises, large enterprises, with the cloud transformation, extreme programming, agile and lean. My interests include, uh, you know, distributed system architecture and uh, high performance applications. Um, I'm a regular at most of these conferences and I love contributing to the community. So these are some of the conferences I've spoken at. So that's about myself. Over to you, Joel. I'm Joel Rosario. I'm a consultant and coach as well. I have about 19 years of experience under my belt. I've worked uh, in development. I've worked uh, in testing. I sometimes find myself with a foot in both camps, which I think is a great place to be. Um, and these days, I help tech teams improve their quality and engineering capabilities across the board. Um, and to start this session off, I'm going to take you to a, a small demo. Um, let's dive right in. I think you, you, so this is about contract-driven development. Uh, let's dive right in and see a contract of an application. This is a sample application here. We have uh, an API for e-commerce, some orders, products, etc. I won't go into this too much. Uh, quick look at the contract. Right, there's a there's a products uh, API with uh, an ID and so on and so forth. Right, I'm sure most of you have seen an open API specification before. Um, I'm just going to dive in and run some tests, right? Let's see where this gets us. Here we go. We have some contract uh, tests that are running. We are using a tool called Specmatic to run these contract tests. And there you go. We have 12 contract tests. Let's take a quick look at the first one. We are saying uh, the test sends get slash product slash 10 to the application and gets a response back. Uh, this response uh, is supposed to match the contract, right? And maybe we can take a quick look at the contract now and see what we have, right? Um, so you have uh, get slash product slash ID that's over here. You have the response that's been defined. So this is what I showed you at the start. Uh, this is the structure, right? Specmatic has, of course, uh, validated the contract test here, validates that uh, this response matches the contract. Right. And that's how we know that the application is in sync. We are trying to make sure the application is in sync with the contract. Here's another test in a similar fashion. We post slash product slash 10. Um, the test sends this in the payload, uh, gets the response back and checks that, you know, 204 no content uh, is as per with actually no content is as per the contract. There are 12 such tests, um, right? Uh, where's the code? Let's take a quick look at the code uh, for this. And uh, that's it. Look, no code. This is just a this is just um, a starter sort of helper class. Um, what essentially happens is we pull Specmatic. This is a Specmatic class uh, that uh, comes into the picture. Specmatic lifts the contract. Uh, you know, reads each and every operation in the contract, turns it into contract tests, executes the contract tests. There are twelve of them that come out of this. And you get this all for free, no code to be used or to be written, except for you know these, these few lines. Uh, you get 12 contract tests pretty much for free. Um, and uh, this is good as it stands. You know, we know the we know that the contract tests from the contract uh, pass, and that means the application you know is in line with the contract. But what if you send requests which do not match up with the contract? Will the application you know behave effectively? Well, let's let's try that. We just the negative testing on, setting it to true. Uh, I'm going to run these tests as well. So just take a second, Specmatic running again. Uh, Spring application is starting. Here we go. Suddenly we have a lot of failing tests, right? The tests fail 26 past 12. 
What's happening here is that the original tests, the happy path tests that I showed you before, uh, those are passing, but now we have a whole bunch of negative tests. Uh, right? What's, let's take a quick look at the first one. There's some no element exception, uh, so on and so forth. Right? What's actually happening under the hood? Uh, and here we see the first example of a negative test. We are passing ID as null, but according to the specification, uh, the open API specification, this is not uh, supposed to be null. Uh, this is supposed to be a number. Um, and Specmatic was able to, you know, take the specification, know that it's not nullable, pass a null in its place, and see how the application responds. The application here has returned a 500. It's not supposed to, um, because this was an invalid request. We should have seen a 400 or something like that. Um, and all of these 26 tests that you get essentially for free, uh, Specmatic just generates it for you uh, out of the contract, right? It's the same line, the same set of code that I've got here. I just added uh, a flag and with this flag on, we get 26 tests. That's a total of 38 tests, which gives you a solid idea uh, about, you know, how, how well your um, application, you know, adheres to the specification that, that uh, it's supposed to. So with that, um, I'd like to hand it over to Hari, um, who will, uh, you know, help us understand how we got to this point from scratch, how we got to this point where we are able to so magically generate tests um, from an open API specification. Over to you, Hari. Thanks, Joel. That was an awesome demo, wasn't it? That was just the teaser, actually, right, uh, of what is to come. And uh, I guess you guys are for, ready for the main show here. Uh, before we get into the deep dive of what we achieved, just to get this context set right, um, uh, to continue from where jo Joel left off, like Joel did something awesome. He just took an open API specification and with practically zero code, he was able to run it as an executable contract test against an application. And he also got it to uh, show where the application's weaknesses lie, wherein if you send a null, the application did not have a null check, right? So now let's actually look at it in the frame of reference of what's actually, uh, how does it all fit in into uh, killing integration tests? So to start with, uh, we have um, a mobile application. Let's assume it's an e-commerce app and it's got a view product screen for showing the product. It requests the details from the backend and uh, the backend provides the details for the requested product. Sounds fairly uh, simple, right? Like what could possibly go wrong with this application? Let's take a little bit more deeper look. How would we write the component test for the mobile application, this view product screen? So uh, just so we are clear on the vocabulary, because the application is requesting the data, we're going to call it the consumer. And since the uh, backend is providing the data, we're going to call it the provider, right? So just so we have the terminology in order. How does consumer component testing look? Any test has three parts to it, right? We all agree that there is a test, there's a system under test, and then there is the dependency. And a good component test ideally isolates the dependency. In this case, the dependency is the real backend application. And uh, as most of you would realize, we don't want to talk to the real application in a staging or a production environment. It's kind of um, you know messy, right, to go across the network. Uh, if you want to get the provider running on a local machine, that's again may or may not be possible, depend depending upon how complex that stack is to bring it up on our local machine, right? So the tried and tested you know approach to that is to sort of have a hand-rolled mock or a record and replay tool sort of simulate the provider for us, like stub it out so that we don't have to have the real provider and we can isolate and test the consumer and develop, uh, start writing code for the consumer. Uh, while this looks uh, quite all right, like we, this is all familiar, right? We use this with wire mock or other record and replay tools. There's a fundamental problem here. The mock, is usually not in line with the provider, right? If you are using a hand-rolled mock or if you did a record and replay, it's very likely that the provider made a code change or an API change and your mock has not made that change, right? Like we did not, how often can we keep pre-recording and playing or keep maintaining this stuff? It's quite expensive. And this fundamental issue can lead to huge problems. Like how? I, as the developer of the consumer application may assume that I could send the product ID as a string, right? And I set up my mock like that. However, 
the actual backend might be expecting the ID as an integer. And likewise, the provider might be returning the name and SKU of the product. However, I have wrongly assumed while setting up my mock that it's going to be returning name and price, right? What does this lead to? Broken integration. Is this the worst of it? No. Where do you find such issues? It's not possible on local, which we just saw. If you're isolating with hand-rolled mocks, it's not possible. And if you are taking the same setup into your continuous integration environment, it's going to repeat, right? And for the provider, the handicap is that there is no true representative uh, emulation of the consumer, right? So again, it is depending on a common deployment location. So the first time you see such issues is when you actually deploy to an integration testing environment and boom, you have a bug and it says these two things are not compatible. Now there's a double whammy of an issue. This compromises your integration testing environment. Most often, it's not likely that you just have two apps in your integration testing, right? You have a deployment of microservices, even if two or three have compatibility issues, the entire environment may get compromised and that may block your path to production, right? And that's unhappy users, which we don't want. There's another problem with regard to cost, effort, and time. So this heat map, which you see at the bottom, obviously represents the reality, right? If you found an issue on your local machine, it's cheapest and easiest to fix. Cycle time is really slow. I mean, small. Uh, if you found it in CI or if you found it later on, it's going to be harder to fix and the resolution time is much higher, right? So that's also not desirable. What we really want here is to be able to shift left, find these issues on the left-hand side and sort of avoid integration testing. However, we do want to find compatibility issues, right? So that's the problem statement. Can we identify compatibility issues without integration testing? So with that, I'll hand it over to Joel again uh, to see if he can solve this problem. Over to you, Joel. So taking off from where Kari left off, we are trying to shift left we are trying to identify compatibility issues without integration testing. These compatibility issues often come up because of some misunderstanding between the consumer and the provider, right? Um, and the reason for that usually is that, you know, they come to an agreement about how uh, the API should behave and, you know, what the request and response should look like. But this agreement uh, might be, you know, over email very often. Uh, we've seen teams collaborate over email a lot in this uh, on, on this topic um there might be multiple emails there might be multiple word documents there might be multiple excel files uh, and so there is a there, there is a common but really a fragmented in some sense understanding you know scattered across different inboxes and desktops so what if as a first step towards fixing this problem we could actually have a solid a rock solid industry standard um, specification that actually contains all the details, right? Uh, for REST, this is open API. Um, and it contains everything from, you know, what the headers should look like to what the JSON payload should look like, right down to is a key, you know, um, mandatory or not, uh, and a lot of rich detail. Right? It's too much to go into right now. Um, and essentially, once you have a specification, you know, with that level of detail and clarity, it becomes much easier for consumers and providers to adhere to the specification. What's even more interesting is that the specification is um, machine readable, right? Uh, and because the specification is machine readable, you suddenly get superpowers because now you can feed this thing to tools. Uh, and when you feed the specification to tools, you start getting early feedback and you can now get early feedback on your laptop in your development environment rather than uh, you know, deploying it to, into integrated environments and getting errors there. Uh, and now the tools locally can help to keep the consumer and provider accountable uh, to the contract. Um, and then the interaction between the consumer and provider then become governed by the specification, right? Um, and so I'm going to actually get a little deeper uh, into that. Let's actually let's actually start off with an exercise, right? A quick exercise. I'd like you to download uh, this contract. I'd like you to download Specmatic and just uh, get this thing running. Um, I'm going to open my chat window briefly. 
and uh, just tell me whether you've been able to get the contract uh, downloaded in, and running if you're following along. I'm going to be doing this myself as well. In the interest of time, uh, I'm going to carry on. Um, we have a small contract here, right? Uh, it's okay if you don't know, you know, in case you don't know OpenAPI too well, I'll just quickly run you through it. This is a products slash ID on you know, API. Uh, the ID is parameterized, so there's a number, uh, which essentially means this, this path you know, matches something like slash products slash 10 or slash 20 or whatever. It's got to be a number. It's compulsory, it's required, it's true. When the application receives this uh, request, you know, it's supposed to get this response back. The response has got to be a JSON object. Um, the object has a name, a skew, both of them are strings, right? Um, pretty simple. We are now going to try to start it up as a stub. You saw the command on screen and I'm going to do the same thing. So, uh, Java minus jar, stub and API. There you go. We have uh, stub loaded. If you're following along and you've gotten this far, you should be seeing something like this stub server is running uh, on port 9000 control system. Okay, that means your stub is running. Um, and then we're going to take this to Postman. I was saying that since you have a machine passable uh, you know, specification, you get superpowers. One of them is that tools understand, tools like Postman understand that you can just drag and drop it uh, into the import button and Postman just opens it. So, you know, I'm going to do that again so you can follow along if you are. Uh, you know, you just need to have Postman open uh, and just, just where my mouse is moving at the top, you have an import button, you click that, you get this uh, text, this area, blank area here. You can open Explorer or Finder if you're on a Mac. Just drag and drop the contract there. Uh, Postman just sucks it up in a jiffy and here you go, get products, right? So I'm going to click on this. I'm going to go ahead and uh, hit one, send. Okay. Specmatic has returned something, right? Uh, this is, of course, looking a little random, right? We see name, uh, some random string. Firstly, this itself is useful because this will help you get started. Uh, secondly, Specmatic did this with absolutely no further code involved from you. Thirdly, given that this is random, you know, you, you actually do want sometimes to tell or much of the time to tell Specmatic what to return. We never told Specmatic what to return uh, for slash product slash one, right? Uh, and uh, so Specmatic just took it back to the contract, checked to the contract, uh, you know, is it right? Fine. Uh, it doesn't know what to do with it. So it looks at the response in the contract and generates, you know, a response. I have done something a little different on my laptop. So if I pass five, Specmatic actually returns something because I've, I've essentially, I've told it what to return. Okay. So, um, this is, this is a quick demo of how we can get Specmatic to use contract, uh, uh open, API, open API specification based service virtualization. Um, just a quick and, pause. Uh, uh, yeah. I just wanted to check if everyone's following along what um, Joel just showed. You could type in yes if yes, you're following along. If you're having a hard time, if you have difficulties, you could put that in the chat. We'll try our best to help you out. Sorry for the interruption, Joel. Go ahead. Please, please. Yeah, anyway. Great, great. I'm glad to see that folks are uh, able to follow this. Pretty cool. Um, so I've I've shown you an example of you know simple service virtualization without uh, uh, the simplicity of doing it without any code. Uh, I'll show you how to how to specify something explicit to Specmatic, you know, further down the line. But this is how you know we can and Specmatic validates this. So I'll, I'll show you how Specmatic validations work as well. Uh, Specmatic would never have returned something like this if it was not con uh, not you know matching the Open API specification. Um, and uh, we do have to take this uh, essentially to the other side as well. Um, and so what what typically happens uh, with a test, if I can you know go over that quickly, 
is you have the open API specification talking to a system under test uh, and Specmatic reads the contract, turns it into contract tests uh, and basically fires those requests against the provider, gets a response and checks if the response is actually valid. Let's see how this works. Let's actually try this um, with a real test. Uh, we are taking this over now to the provider side. I'd like you to download one more file. This is the provider sample. Um, and uh, download it and get this running with Java minus Java products, etc. cetera. Um, like before, I'm going to give you a minute uh, to do this. I'm going to move ahead now. We shall try to run this as a test as well. Um, let me actually start the application. The application is kicked off. I'm going to start a new tab. Okay, and we have a contract test running. This is something similar to what you would have seen at the start. We've just got one contract here. The contract test, Specmatic has generated the contract test from, uh, from the contract. Uh, we have a request, get products 579. Uh, we have a response returned from the application uh, that is uh, you know, for the contract. Um, and that the test has passed because Specmatic realizes that the response is, you know, according to the contract, which is great. What would happen if uh, the response does not match the contract? So um, I'm hoping folks have been able to follow along, uh, right? Uh, can I can I have a quick uh, check if uh, people are able to follow? All right, thank you, thank you. Um, so essentially, let's make let's make a change to the contract. So we are now trying to figure out what would Specmatic say if the contract is out of sync with the application. Right. And to do that, we'll you know make a change to the contract here because we don't have the application source, which is you know normally where the source of the errors is. Uh, so we change the contract. So you just change the SKU to a number. Uh, it was supposed to be a string. We know the application is returning a string, and we run the same command again. Right, and now Specmatic actually uh, gives you the same contract expected number, but response contained book SKU for which is a string. And essentially, um, what this means is uh, the you know this is pinpointed feedback response to a body or SKU. Uh, Specmatic was expecting a number. The response contained a string. You get that feedback right here. Uh, and uh, this thing can be integrated with uh, CI and other things. We'll talk about that later. Uh, the, the main thing to take away is both in the previous demo and in this one, there was no code uh, that I had to write to get these, uh, get this test running. There was no code that I had to write uh, to, to faithfully represent uh, you know, my, my provider. Um, I was able to faithfully represent you know, each to both. So this is symmetrical as a consumer. You need to faithfully represent your uh, provider, uh, right? And you use the contract uh, for that. As a provider, you need to faithfully represent your consumer. And so you use, uh, you generate contract tests out of the consumer, right? This is, this is how uh, this would typically work. The consumer and the provider have only the contract when they start off. Uh, the consumer uh, essentially, uh, you know, starts off on the local development environments, your laptop. Consumer doesn't have uh, the provider running locally, obviously, but we have the contract using which we can faithfully uh, simulate the provider. The way we do this is we pass it to Specmatic. Uh, Specmatic generates a contract as stub, uh, which allows the consumer to run a faithful high fidelity service virtualization. Specmatic also generates contract as test 
which allows the provider without having the consumer uh, to run a high fidelity simulation of the consumer. Um, and this means one does not have to wait for the other. So the consumer can start development uh, without the provider being uh, available. The provider can start development uh, without the consumer being available. The two of them can then deploy uh, with confidence into an integrated environment because they have both ensured that they stay faithful to the contract. Okay, this is a very brief uh, demo of how things work. Uh, as a next step, I want to talk about, uh, well, smart service virtualization. I'd like to do a deep dive. So I showed you a little bit about uh, how service virtualization could work. I'm going to take it further now, and we are going to actually see in this, switch over to the other one. We're actually going to see service virtualization in action. I don't have anything for you to try here. This one is going to be uh, a demo. So let's take a look at this contract uh, briefly. We have, uh, I've shown you some of this before. I think you will be familiar with uh, this portion of the contract. There's a new piece to this, uh, you know, uh, just a small additional API for creating products. Essentially, you have slash products. The request body accepts a JSON with two fields, a name and a disk AU. And in the response to this API, the provider is expected to respond an ID, which is an integer. Now, um, essentially, we are going to start the stub again. Uh, right, this uh, is a vanilla stuff. I'm going to import this into Postman as well. Hold one and import. Right, there you go. Postman has imported both of them. Um, we've done this before. Right, we've seen this random response. Um, we've done this before as well, passing five. But this time we are getting a random response because I haven't told uh, I haven't told uh, Specmatic what to do with it. Right. Uh, this time I'm going to do that uh, in front of you so you can see how that works. So I'm going to I'm going to just uh, create a, a folder about it, the name of this, uh, uh, the contract is products underscore API. So this is called products underscore API, uh, products hyphen API underscore data. We create a file there. Um, what it, batteries dot JSON because it was returning some information about batteries. Let's take this small snippet and make some changes here. Right. This is this is exactly what we saw at the start with the call to slash products. We get this data back, and let me let me start this off now. Right. There you go. You have batteries back, and this is how you tell Specmatic what to return uh, when uh, you fire slash product slash five. Uh, the very first question that we will want to know after this is what happens when we try to stub out the whole uh, point of using this is what happens when we try to stub something out that does not match uh, the specification. Right? Let's say instead of SKU, ABC123, just said 123. This is a number. We know this does not match the contract. Uh, Specmatic is going to take a moment to load that and says contract expected string, but stub contained 123, which is a number. Um, and that basically is pinpointed feedback right there. We are basically uh, Specmatics telling you that you were expecting uh, a string, but you got a number, you can't do this. And and if you go back to Postman and fire this request, you get the random response back. Basically, Specmatic discarded that. So it will never uh, load uh, a stuff that uh, does not match the contract. Right? I'm going to switch this back to ABC123. Um, 
and uh, let's just add a new one. So now let's say we didn't want to just specify batteries. We wanted to use something like soap as well. Maybe. Change this here, change this here, right? Save that, Specmatic. So Specmatic follows along, right? Specmatic just watches the file system and loads things back again whenever there's change. Go back to Postman, it's actually saying 10, right? Five still works. Uh, I realize I have not changed this SKU ID, right? Uh, SKU ID for soap and batteries is the same. And honestly, I don't care for the purpose of this demo. Um, so let's just tell Specmatic you generate it for me. I really don't want to have to bother to change it. I just want it to be different every time. Uh, we can give Specmatic a chance to sort of uh, reload that. And uh, then we go back and let's try this again. This SKU is not randomly generated. We really didn't care, right? Uh, and now, now let's say there's something more. Towels, you know, we change this to 15 towels. We anyway didn't care about SKUs. We just leave that alone. Life is easy now, right? Essentially, you don't have to care about the things you don't care about. Leave that to Specmatic um, and specify the values that you really want to see. Specmatic will do it for you. Um, right, uh, and Specmatic will not load uh, a specific uh, a stub unless it matches uh, the contract. Now let me let me try something a little different. We've seen how we are, you know, putting payloads in the response. Let me flip that to the other side. Let's take a payload in the request. So, notebook, for example, this time we are going to create. Right, I showed you there was another uh, API. Um, let me just quickly check the chat and see how folks are doing. So there was another API for creating products, which right? so was a post. Um, I'll show you that. I'm changing this around now. There was a there was a body section here. So now now this is notebook. Right? The SKU ID was something like uh, one, two, three, say, uh, and. And the, the return value was an ID. Now that we've created it, we need say ID 10. Right. Let's just save that. Uh, and it loaded it, right? It's loaded it over here. Notebook is here. So we know that this matches the specification. Great. Let's uh, let's uh, double check that this is working the way we intended it. I'm going to the add product request, which got imported with uh, Postman a moment back. Notebook and R three send that and we get a two hundred right. Um, so that's uh, that's Specmatic stubbing out something in the request. Uh, let's try that again. We should get the same kind of feedback in case SKU is a number. Immediately we are told that contract expected string but stub contain ten. That's a number, so that's wrong. Um, let me revert that. Let me revert that. I I do wanted to have this for a moment. Uh, Specmatics is just uh, should just reload that in a second. Yeah. What 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 if what if for example we we passed uh, the number here, right? So we've Specmatic has loaded the stub, but we are passing uh, and the wrong value in the request itself. What would happen? You've seen this message before, right? Uh, you get a request for ESTU, expected string, but request contain 10. So the, you, you're not, Specmatic holds you accountable both when you're setting the expectation up, uh, but also when you, when the application makes a request to the service virtualization, to the virtualized you know, product uh, API, Specmatic would hold the application accountable there as well. Um, so uh, this, this is, Work. Interestingly, sorry, forgot to mention one thing. Uh, this and this also comes in handy. Uh, this error response came back with a 400 bad request, uh, right? And the fact that it came back with a 400 bad request is useful because you can check the status message uh, and you immediately know that uh, something is amiss. We'll see how this comes in handy later uh, when I show you a demo how to use this in an actual test. So uh, this is good. I think we've got pretty far. Um, the next thing that we need to look at is uh, 
all of these stubs that we've created here are statically created. Statically meaning they are files on the file system. Uh, once they are created, they can't be changed. And when they are created all before Specmatic uh, loads, right? If you create a new one, you create it as a file, you Specmatic restarts and detects it. This is already very useful, but sometimes that might not be enough. Sometimes you might actually want to create a resource uh, on the fly, right? Uh, and then and then simulate the fact that that, that ID is going to be uh, you know detected. So for example, what if the ID is not, um, you know, what if I need to simulate the ID ahead of time? What if I need to, you know, um, create, uh, if, 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 I, if I have a get API for products, for example, and, and let's say the ID is something I can't control. I can't control that ID. So slash product slash ID is something I cannot control. I really need to um, create the resource in the test on the fly. And while that's going on, I need to pick that ID up and send it to Specmatic. Basically, at that point, uh, Specmatic has started, the tests are running, and I, did, I didn't know what the ID was. I need to be able to specify the ID and, in fact, this entire content to Specmatic dynamically. So let me, let, me show you, let me show you how that works. Okay, I'm going to take this. Let me just start this back once again. I'm going to take this to uh, a Postman request. Let's post here. Say HTTP colon slash slash local host nine thousand underscore specmatic slash expectations. Right. Um, let me get into the body. Get into raw. Right. And and here I'm going to tell specmatic what to or, or or let me let me do that with one of the others instead right? something like this yeah. so i'm going to tell specmatic 30 slash product slash 30 right? uh return something new tablets or whatever it is with some random escape um and i fire this here right this was not done with the file specmatic returns a 200 200 just means specmatic has validated this with the contract Validating this essentially means, you know, we know the contract contains uh, a, a, an API with slash products, slash products, slash 30, right? Specmatic would find the API where ID is a parameter. It would know it's a get, we check that. That API has a response that is shaped like this. So this is all validated. And it's accepted, and Specmatic returns 200. So when we now want to get products and say 30, we get tablets back. Right. Um, let's quickly try and see what happens if we try to simulate something that is not for the contract. So suppose, for example, we want to say uh, SKU ID of 200, right? Will Specmatic allow this? Specmatic will not, uh, right? We say no match was found, error from contracts, in scenario, get products, so on and so forth. We've seen this uh, error message before. Specmatic is holding you accountable. This time it's happening in the test. So when the test uh, attempts to set this expectation up uh, with Specmatic, Specmatic will return a 400 bad request and your test can die right there, right? Um, I will show you um, more in depth how this works. This is kind of just to add to what Joel mentioned, just mentioned, right? This is super powerful because if you have a sequence of tests, right? Like, you know, you're making API calls as part of a test. The result of the first API call feeds into the uh, request for the second API call. So obviously you cannot know ahead of time what to send. So in those cases, these are really, really powerful. And that's that's just pretty awesome demo, which just Joel did. Uh, go ahead, Joel. Okay. Um, essentially, this is what, this is the anatomy of a test, uh, right? Um, so I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to actually take this ahead. I'm going to take this uh, further and show you how this works with an actual piece of code. So you have a test, you have system under test and you have dependency. This is typically how it works, right? Uh, on, on a component, uh, developer's laptop, uh, there's a test which invokes a system under test, which hits a dependency. The test would be some component test using some testing framework, uh, say Selenium. Say uh, Appium, 
uh, right? For example, uh, you could be hitting some mobile app or some product screen. Um, you would be hitting some dependency. And in the case of the component test here, the dependency would be Specmatic, which would be started up um, and would be fed the contracts like I've shown you before. Now, there are three parts to a component test. Uh, that's basically what we call a range, which is the first piece. A range essentially is responsible for telling Specmatic what to do. Um, this is setting expectations where we are setting Specmatic up so that the system under test can talk to it. Um, and if the Specmatic validates the expectation, if the expectation uh, you know adheres to the specification, then that's great. Uh, it will accept it. Um, we will act, then the test will act uh, by hitting the product screen. Product screen would hit Specmatic. Specmatic would return a response. Um, and uh, the product screen returns a response, which would then be asserted. Right? The return value would be asserted by the test. Um, and uh, the test actually passes, or fails, as the case may be. Um, and I'm going to show you how this would work. Uh, just a quick note that uh, we are, uh, you know, anything that has dependencies is a consumer. So the most visible consumer that we have these days is a mobile phone. And so we've been showing mobile phones, but that could be, you know, a mobile phone, that could be a website, that could be a microservice, right? Uh, uh, microservices have, uh, may have to make API calls too. Um, and the test framework could be anything. Uh, could be Karate, could be Selenium, could be, you know, uh, Apple could be whatever it is. Uh, the main thing that I want to emphasize here is the arrange, act, and assert uh, components of a test. Where arrange is, you set up the, uh, you know, the, the service virtualization so that the test can run. Uh, you you uh, act, which means that you actually invoke the application, um, and then you assert, which basically means that you check the application's response. So let's uh, quickly uh, see how that works. Uh, this is a sample karate test, right? Uh, as I was saying, microservices could be consumers too. Uh, this is an API test, but we are testing um, a microservice that itself has dependencies, right? And so the very first step is to set up Specmatic so that the dependency which is Specmatic behaves you know, as expected. Um, you've seen this before. This is the expectations URL. You've seen this request, uh, this shape of it at least, you know, send a get, when you get a get uh, to slash products with query parameters type and gadget, you know, return this response. Uh, and then this is this is the point in the test where we send the request out. And then this statement is an assertion. We're saying then status 200. That means Specmatic would have returned a response. And if the res response was 200, that means Specmatic, you know, accepted uh, the request. And if the response was not 200, which means it's a 400, uh, right? Specmatic has not accepted it, right? That means that for some reason, this this uh, did not match the contract. Um, and the test dies right here. Uh, Specmatic's response is logged, of course. The test dies right here, and we don't move ahead to the act section. So this itself gives you early feedback that, you know, the way you say you want Specmatic to behave, it's not how the actual API is going to behave. We tell you right then and there that the test doesn't even run. Uh, the act and assert don't even run. But assuming that Specmatic accepted this, uh, right, we come to the act uh, section, which means we make the call to the microservice. The microservice internally will call its dependency, which is Specmatic. Uh, you know, and then once that's done, we assert in the microservices uh, response, right? Um, and this essentially, this essentially is how a typical uh, range act assert test would look. Um, and this helps the consumer to stay in line with the provider. Somewhere down the line, uh, I'm not sure if you would have noticed, uh, I started using the word contract instead of open API specification. Uh, the reason for that is that a specification is great, um, right? Because it contains a lot more detail than a word document, so it's already a step up. But it is, uh, you know, it doesn't actually hold uh, either side accountable to staying in sync with it. Um, but once you start executing the specification, as service virtualization on the consumer side and as contract tests on the provider side. Uh, at this point, you are actually using it 
to hold both sides accountable and now it starts functioning as a contract um, and so that's why we uh, start thinking of them as executable contracts so with that i am now going to hand the session uh, back over to hari um hari is going to show you how it works on the provider side that i have shown you um, a good deep dive of how service virtualization works to hold the consumer accountable to the contract the next step is how do we hold the provider accountable to the contract over to you hari thanks joel that was a super nice deep dive into the service virtualization world um let me just press on my screen all righty i think uh, the important part to understand here is not just about stubbing right like what joel earlier showed you have two sides to the coin here wherein unless you take the same specification and make it as a contract for stubbing out the provider on the consumer side and on the provider side we need to run the specification as a contract test and that's how we keep the two sides balanced right so i'm going to go do a deep dive of the contract as a test approach now so let's look at uh, what we're trying to achieve so this slide is already familiar to you from earlier when uh, uh, joel mentioned this like uh, essentially specmatic is able to pull an open api specification convert it into a bunch of contractors and based on that generate http requests and verify the response and this was done with an existing provider application right the jar file which you guys tried now what if the application does not exist in the first place right and we have to begin to build this from scratch so how about we attempt doing some live coding and we let open api specification and specmatic guide our development itself for the provider let's try it okay so by now i think you must be all too familiar with the specification uh it's got just one endpoint here uh which is the products slash id and there is the get operation on it and it's supposed to give you the product pack and uh, i will just repeat the command which uh joel already ran earlier just so we are all on the same page here and connection refused obviously because the application does not exist we haven't built it so let's start building out the app so i'm going to be using spring boot for this today uh, however uh, specmatic itself is language and technology stack agnostic it works on top of http right in this case so it really does not care in which stack you're building your provider application it is still able to test it out and give you feedback so um, as a good first step i think i want to show you that this is a blank spring boot application that i just generated out of start.spring.io it's got nothing here just one empty controller and i'm gonna boot it up and uh, once the app is running i'm gonna go back and repeat the command again specmatic test and this time what do you anticipate there is no connection refused however it says i was expecting a 200 okay however i got back a 404 not found and this is understandable right because we did not we do not have any path for this url we don't have this get operation at all defined so let's go ahead and define it so i'm gonna copy paste in some of this code which i have as a snippet let's put that here and like any good developer would do i'm going to start with hello world right this is a perfectly valid endpoint and uh, i can reboot the app and then see what happens however this is becoming a little bit of a hassle right which is uh, keeping on start restarting the application running it from the command line is there a more integrated approach yes there is uh, specmatic provides a jonet support jonet 5 support and note that this is a test implementation dependency only in Gradle, which means it does not have to ship as part of your production code. It's only in the context of your test code, right? So I've added this dependency in, and then I've uh, set up a contract as test, which you are also familiar with from earlier, which uh, Joel showed. I have just extended the Specmatic JUnit support and pretty much just done simple. Uh, plumbing right start the app and stop the app and set up and tear down respectively apart from that whatever is in the command line here the coordinates to where the application is running and the location of the open api file itself those are the pieces of information i'm providing specmatic through system properties and that's pretty much all so now all i need to do is run this test and that should be good enough so let's try it out 
I'm gonna switch to running the contract test and run. And like earlier Naresh said, this is money for nothing and test for free. So free tests, who wouldn't want one? And this time around, we don't see the uh, you know expected 200, but got 404. This time it's a different issue, right? It says I got a 200, but instead I was expecting a JSON object, but you gave me hello world. And that makes sense, right? Because our API specification says we're looking for a schema that looks something like this a product, which has got a name and an SKU, and all I've returned is a dumb hello world. That's not necessarily helpful. So let's actually comply with the specification now. So I'm going to drop in the product data object and try returning something that complies well with the specification. So uh, I'm going to say, I will return this product, which is a book with this SKU. Looks about all right. Everyone following along. Okay. So let's see when in doubt, run the test, right? Always. Will it pass? Hooray, the first green for the day. Okay. So which means you have potentially gone from zero code to some code and, uh, you know, and this whole thing was guided by the open API specification. There is a, a important point I want to call out at this moment, which is look how Specmatic really does not care whether you actually wired it up with the database and pulled the information out and then returned it. Specmatic is only worried about your signature, your API signature, right? So, which is why when you're talking about contract tests, you have to understand that contract tests verify your API signature and therefore they are not a replacement for component slash API tests, right? Which are actually about logic. And there's a, there's an important differentiation that you need to understand that this just separates the concern of verifying the signature and gives you early feedback. This supplements and sort of increases your ability to find out issues early on without actually writing too much code, right? If your signature itself is not in line, then why bother writing the rest of the logic? I just want to call that out quickly, and then let's get back to our development, right? Now, this is not interesting. This is like, you know, very simple app. The fact that you have been able to get to this point guided by specification is pretty good. But then I want to make this app a little bit more complicated in real life. Like, right? so in real life, let's say you would have a service call, uh, you know, to uh, fetch the data from database and then return the product, right? So what if your seed data or your test data in your database only has product ID two and nothing else? Uh, However, Specmatic is just auto-generating the product ID, right? It's just a number. And like what Joel already showed, it could be any number that is sent. And you cannot potentially have all those random numbers sitting in a database, right? So let's assume that's going to happen. So if your service says, if the product ID is not found in my database, I'm just simulating that if it's not equal to two, assuming I have only a product with ID two in my DB, then I'm going to throw a runtime exception. Yeah. So the service is doing its right thing. Like, I don't know what you're talking about for every random ID that you give me, I cannot give you a product. So I'm going to throw this error. So what do I do now? Let's run the test and see what happens. It failed. What do you guess will be the error? 400? No. It is a 500. Oh my, uh, you're not supposed to get 500, right? It's not a good place to be. Uh, it was expecting a 200, but got a 500, obviously because it's an unhandled exception. The web framework here spring handled the, you know, caught that error and handled the exception and then converted that to a 500 and returned it to us. So now the issue is Specmatic does not know that it needs to send two because that's the only row available in the DB. So we need to help Specmatic by giving it a clue that, hey, don't send random numbers, send a, a number that's in my DB. So how do I do that? I can give Specmatic a clue through open API examples. So what I can do here is uh, say for a 200 okay response, I want the value to be two. Okay. And there's one more thing I'm going to do, which is for this particular request where I'm sending the product ID as two, I want 
uh, a corresponding response also. And I'm going to say this guy, right? You remember this data? This is the exact same data that you saw in the controller here, book one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And that's what I'm saying here. And notice how I have named in line number 24, 200 okay. And line number 39, 200 okay. Both these examples on the request and the response side are named same. Open API as such does not really correlate examples, but Specmatic is able to correlate and give you that convenience, which is to say for this request, I want this response and I'm going to verify. So will this pass? Let's try it out. All right. You went from red to green to red to green. It's a good rhythm to be, right? However, I'm not happy with what happened earlier, right? Which is we saw an ugly 500 and that's not a right place to be in. Whenever there is a not found error, you should potentially, uh, you know, what, what is the right error to be throwing? You should be giving back a 404 status code, correct? So let's make that change. So where do I think I should make it? Should I start writing the code right here? Doesn't make sense, right? We are driving the uh, implementation through the specification. So first I need to make the API design right. So I'm going to put the, uh, you know, the 404 response here into this guy and say, apart from the 200, I also have another response for when there are no products found with that particular detail, I'm going to give back a 404 and these, this is my error response. Uh, you know, situation, it's going to give me my status, the error, error type, and what is the path that the issue happened on. There is a problem now, just like I've given an example for 200. Okay. And I said, send ID two. now for 404 Specmatic does not know what to do. Right. So, you know, the drill, it's just a clue. I need to give it right. So I'm going to say, uh, give it a meaningful name and, uh, set up an example that, uh, in order to generate a 404 response, send the ID as zero. Not likely that zero is going to be in my DB, right? So I'm just going by that. And you also guessed it right. I need a corresponding example on the response side, right? So that we know what to map it to. So this time around, I put the example here and I say 404. Earlier, if you noticed, I put in the exact details of the book in the SKU. This time around, I don't care because it's error, but I just definitely worry that it is in line with what uh, is the actual schema. So I'm just uh, setting up the same data types here. So I have done this specification change and uh, which means now my open API operation looks something like this, which is I have products, I have get, and I have two responses, 200 and 404. We have the example set up for it. All right, let's run the test now. What do, you think, what do you expect will happen? Red again. Okay, this time around, it's an interesting error. Expected 404, got 500. Why do you think this happens? Because Specmatic rightly sent out zero, right? For the second example, but expected a 404, how oh, we got a 500. And why is that happening? Quite obvious, we haven't written code to handle the not found exception, right? So how do we do that in Spring Boot? Fairly straightforward. I just need to create a exception class and uh, map it out. I'm gonna do that straight away. So I put in product not found exception and uh, when the product is not found, instead of throwing a runtime exception, I'm gonna throw a product not found exception, which is indeed the right thing to do. And thereby I give a spring a clue that I'm throwing this. So if you handle it, return a not found, which is a 404 HTTP status code. What do you think will happen now? Green. Excellent. So we went from zero code to having like actually build out the basic application, realizing that we have a 500 and then designing the API in the process. Like, you know, we went ahead and added the 404 response and uh, only wrote the code after we wrote the specification. Isn't this very similar to test-driven development and specifically this practice called tracer bullet approach, right? Where you use the test to flesh out your system. Like uh, it's, it's a very powerful uh, way of thinking about it. And just like how test-driven development is not about testing, it's about designing your code. Contract-driven development here is not about 
contract testing your api it's about designing your api as well and designing your architecture itself well well that said i'm not saying that this is the only way to write code with the contract driven development i just am particularly fond of uh, writing test before code and i like this traceability approach because it gives me a nice design longevity for my application and what not uh, specmatic as a tool itself is flexible to fit in with any setup for example when joel showed earlier it worked with an existing application also right so uh, but with contract driven development as an approach i would personally recommend that you try this approach and it's definitely quite uh, interesting to uh, learn from and see how what sort of mistakes we sort of make and how it can guide us through uh, designing better apis and eventually designing better applications so that was tracer bullet with uh, open api specifications and uh, let me do a quick recap uh, what we did is we started with the contract as a test we showed how we can use specmatic junit support to have like really quick iterations and then we showed how we can use open api examples to give clues to open api so that it sends the right kind of data out to this system so that according to the test data it behaves well and very important point is that uh, contract tests are not a replacement for your component tests however they are super important because even with api tests today and component tests today you still have integration issues identified only in integration in environment right much later but contract tests are going to find that much earlier in the cycle and thereby have them both they are not a replacement for each other all right so with that i'll hand it over to joel for another interesting topic over to you joel thanks sari so we've just uh, seen hari show us in a very interesting demo uh, how we can keep the provider in line with the contract okay this means we have seen um, two sides to two pieces to this so far how do you keep the provider in line how to keep the consumer in line that means that given a contract we know that the two of them can stay in lockstep what we now need to take a look at is what happens when you have to change the contract right the contract can also be changed this can happen for a variety of reasons um you know there might be some business exigencies will change new pieces will have to be developed um the contract may have to accept new apis or uh, accept new input uh, so on and so forth right and what is the number one fear that we might have when we change the contract you've got everything working today you tested you know you've got your consumers working providers are you know and consumers are integrated everything's working fine we change the contract is that going to break consumers today right and that is a founded fear and uh, uh i think firstly consumer and provider will stay in sync with the contract uh, and that's great um but if you only want to make this change to the provider right you want to make a change only to the provider you want to make sure that consumers don't break uh, as a result how do you how do you make that change we don't want to touch the consumers in the environment this is called backward compatibility right backward compatibility means i am changing the contract uh in a way that would not break consumers uh this means they don't have to touch my consumers at all uh and then my provider changes to match the contract so the first step in that process is make sure that provide that the contract itself is backward compatible just quickly revisiting uh you know what this looks like without a contract is you would you know um consumer would send some request to the provider the provider is updated uh the provider sends back maybe a response that the consumer does not understand consumers break right you discover this feedback in an integrated environment what we have shown you is maybe you can discover this feedback um while the developer is building the application um right but that still doesn't serve the purpose because in fact we don't want anything to break at all we would ideally like to make a change so that the provider can change can gain new functionality and consumers don't even break Right, that's just work work for everyone, um, and this means that we got to figure this out even before handing the contract off to a developer. Um, and we have an interesting way to do this, which I'm not going to you know uh, demo right now. But it's a uh, it's essentially it turns out you can you can run contract tests out of the existing contract. We've seen how that works. Uh, you can 
run service virtualization out of a contract. We've seen how that works as well, right? But what if you run the two of them against each other? So you you take the contract of the existing the existing contract, basically run contract tests against the changed contract, right? Um, and the reason this is interesting is contract tests simulate the provider. So a contract a contract test running from today's contract means this is how today's consumers. Uh, sorry, my bad. A contract test simulate the consumer. Contract test simulate the consumer faithfully. Um, and uh, this means that contract tests running out of an existing contract uh, simulate the consumers uh, as they would look today. Service virtualization uh, simulates a provider, uh, right? And if you run service virtualization from the changed contract, this is how a provider would look with the updates. And so when the contract tests from the existing contract uh, pass against a service virtualized uh, new contract, right? Service virtualization or a stub of the new contract. It means that existing consumers will understand uh, the provider even after the change to the contract, which automatically means they are backward compatible. Essentially, we are running contract versus contract. Um, this is a pretty interesting approach. We haven't seen anyone do this before. It's patent pending. Uh, and by doing this, it is possible to identify backward compatibility problems even before the contract uh, changes reach the developer. Um, and we are therefore able to make sure that backward compatible changes alone reach the developer uh, and the consumers don't break when these changes are made. Um, of course, there may be reasons uh, to break backward compatibility, but th then that will be an explicit choice. And Hari will talk later about uh, how to handle this in a seamless way. Just to add to uh, what that, Joel was mentioning earlier on that slide, uh, the contract versus the contract is really powerful, like what he mentioned, is because uh, when you are just verifying the backward compatibility with zero code, how much does it cost really? You know, If you think about it, you don't even have to have your provider or consumer change a single line of code. All you're doing is just verify. If the contract change itself, you could experiment with it. What if I change this? What's going to happen? Am I going to break backward compatibility? You could ask such questions to Specmatic and Specmatic could tell you those. So that's why it makes it interesting. Again, yes, just wanted to add that point to what Joel was sharing earlier. Yeah, thanks, Hari. And with that, I will hand it over back to Hari for the next section, which is contract as code. Over to you, Hari. Thanks, Joel. All right, so very quickly, uh, so that we're all like well into this workshop right now and you're in uh, in the deep, right? So we have done three different, uh, three major things, right? Which is we've done service virtualization, which is contract as stub. We've done contract as test and we've done contract versus contract. Essentially all in the interest of making sure that we do not break compatibility between the consumers and providers. That's the goal, right? And that's the problem statement with which we started also, right? However, there is a fundamental practice or a fundamental uh, you know, aspect which we need to consider. If not, that could break everything and bring us back to square one. How is that? Let me just go over that. So right now you have the open API specification practically acting like the glue between the consumer and the provider while they are developing in isolation. right? And uh, there could be a potential situation where let's say I am the provider engineer. I made a change to the provider application However, I forgot for whatever reason to upload the latest version of the open API file into the location where it is shared, right? Or I may be the consumer engineer and I'm referring to a stale version of the open API spec. Maybe uh, the provider engineer emailed it to me. I did not notice the latest version. I'm still referring to the old one and thereby I still am on the old version of the truth, right? So what happens? Isn't this looking very familiar to the initial slide that we shared? We're back to square one, right? Like we are on different pages. So how is this? Uh, how are we going to get beyond this? Like, you know, all the fancy contract is testing, contract is stubbing, and still this doesn't make sense, right? The only solution to this is if we start treating open API as a single source of truth or any specification to that matter should be treated as a single sort of source of truth and stored in such manner. Uh, why I'm calling this out very specifically is because with teams I've worked with, I've seen scenarios where you store certain, uh, you know, you share open API over emails or you potentially have it in some shared folder 
and we look at it and there's not much rigor around it right what we found in our experience is the best place to store open api is a version control system and in our case we've been using git and what better place to store it open api is code right it's machine parsable and it rightly belongs in a in a version control system and if you are choosing to keep your specifications in a central location in a version control system across teams and across organization as a single source of truth you also want some process around it in order to get it there right so the process that we've been following on some other teams is to first have a style check or a lint check on uh, you know the specification itself to see if it's number one adhering to the industry standards and number two if you have any specific standards within your organization are you in line with it basically you know circumventing some of the manual review of all these processes we try to codify the review as much as possible into a lint or a style check process we use spectral as a tool for this but uh, it's not necessarily uh, like the only tool we recommend but it's uh, any tool that can do a style check is a good idea and once you pass that basic point then comes the backward compatibility contract versus contract checking which joel just spoke about and what specmatic does here is it just needs the two version two files right like to say this is the old file i have this api and this is a new file with a minor change in it and i'm going to compare and say if the change is compa backward compatible or not yes or no it's a binary answer right so in this case it's not comparing two files but rather because it's a pull request or a merge request uh, it can take the uh, version of the file that is modified from the branch and it can take the corresponding specification file from the central repository run a zero code comparison like wherein you don't have to write any code specmatic is going to run the comparison for you and let you know if it's backward compatible if and only if that is compatible then you move on to the next stage in the process which could potentially be a manual review if needed and then you merge the pull request and make thereby the change flows into the central repo so now you must be asking what happens if the specifications are not backward compatible sometimes we do need to make a change to our api right like which is going to break backward compatibility because we want to evolve the features right so that's when we sort of version bump to communicate so the way we version uh, we've been uh, trying to leverage the semantic versioning practice where we use the major version in the file name itself to say you know uh, this is products hyphen 2.0.0 to 3.0.0 because it's a completely backward and compatible change and it's communicated very clearly to the consumer through the versioning and a minor version upgrade is it's a compatible change nevertheless but we do want to communicate it right so i could go from 2.0.0 to 2.1.0 and uh, patch version is mostly indicative that there's a change but not necessarily in behavior like a structural change right so if you have a large open api file it's very common practice to extract some common data structures into reusable components inside the component section in this schema right so if you're doing only structural change and no practical change to endpoints or their behavior then that could be a patch version upgrade and uh, this is again like just a recommendation like this is what we've been following with some success but that said uh it's up to individual teams and organizations sometimes in terms of how to manage it uh with that i just want to show you how uh like you know as a uh, contract repository itself looks right so uh i have three applications here this is a sample project on our github we'll share links later so we have the order contracts which is the central repo the api which is the provider and the ui which is the consumer just the three uh you know participants in this thing right and the order contracts itself is a fairly straightforward repository we organize our files more like java package names or c sharp package names just like how we manage code because that way instead of having all the open api specifications flat in the parent directory having some sort of package naming gives you that control of you know how to locate easily right so that's what we do here and if you look at the files themselves this is all very familiar to you this is open api file and then you have the corresponding static stuffs which joel uh, demonstrated earlier so we have all of that sitting here and that's your uh, you know central contract repo as an example just wanted to show you that now back to our deck right so if you have your code in the central repo and then you have 
your consumer application and provider uh, engineer, sorry, the consumer team and the provider team sitting and developing on their local machines. How do we reference this file, right? Like does every every time do we have to like, you know, git clone, git clone, is that going to be scalable? Um, it is it is possibly, but then for the purpose of convenience and also to make sure there is consistency and correctness in how this works. Uh, Specmatic has this config file for, called specmatic.json, right? And uh, all it does is it's, it kind of gives you a list uh, you can put in what all what are the open API files that your application needs because it's the central repo to an organization at times. There could be hundreds, if not thousands, of specification files sitting there. So you don't want to list everything, you don't want everything on your machine, right? You just want what interests you as a microservice or as a smaller application. So you just say, I want this, this, and this. And then Specmatic will fetch it for you and make it available to you on your local. And how does the specmatic.json look? Let's take a quick look. So uh, I'm going to show you the uh, syntax that really matters in the context of this workshop. So first thing is the coordinates to where the repository itself is. Here we are saying that the repository is a Git repo, and here's the location. It's an Azure Git repo. And then we are saying, uh, you know, uh, this contract is to be used as a test, and this is to be used as a stub. And why is that important? Again, calling your attention to this. We had these three projects, right? The API being the provider and the UI being the consumer. And the order uh, YAML is going to be used differently by both of these people, right? The UI obviously wants to stub out the, um, one moment. The UI obviously wants to stub out the, uh, you know, uh, the provider. So thereby it will try to list it under the stub category, right? It says, I want to stub the order API. And that's why it's listed under stub. And uh, for the provider, which is the API, it wants to run the order specification as a test. So that's why it's listed under the test section. So that's very quickly into how a Specmatic like deeply integrates into your, you know, setup, and you don't really have to like point to files manually. Specmatic will do all that for you and give you the convenience of it. All right. So with that, in uh, knocked out, let's get into the details of it and what does it take that you know we've been running all of this on our local machines how can we embrace contract driven development and how does it affect your ci pipeline itself right so we know for now the facts are that open api uh, or any other specification to that matter is sitting in a central repository so it's a single source of truth and specmatic is reading that on the top, you have the, the consumer team, which is the view product screen. And the, at the bottom, you have the products API screen, which is the provider team. So Specmatic, as you already seen on the local environment, is able to stop the provider for the consumer and run the contract as a test for the provider, right? So now what remains is what happens in the CI. So for the consumer, you run unit tests as usual. Nothing changes there. But in the component text, test section, where the dependency comes into picture, in order to stub out the dependency, all you need to do is use the specmatic dependency, right? Which is the contract as a stub, which you have been using on your local. So it's pretty much the same. Specmatic is just a jar file, right? So it runs pretty much anywhere. That's the only change on this consumer side. On the provider, again, you run the unit test. However, you then run the contract test before you run your component test. Right. Obviously, you want to verify signature before you verify logic. And with that, you can deploy with confidence to the integration testing environment. And you know for sure they're going to be working well together. And that means you have an unblocked path to production and a happy user. And from the heat map point of view, you are identifying bugs much earlier in the green part of the heat map. You're not identifying the issue here. You're identifying it on your local or worst case, maybe CI. So that's pretty much how you embrace, uh, you know, contract driven development. And with that, we open it up for QA. Thank you all for being a very patient audience. Okay, thank you so much, Hari and Joel, for such an insightful session. Like uh, it was really very, very knowledgeable session. So thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today. And thank you, audience, for like having this patience because it's so it was such a long session but i think uh, they managed to connect us with this session and we all were able to get these concepts very well